Grace and peace in the name of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I am Pastor Aaron Gurner, and I'd like to welcome you to our class on systematic theology. And in our last class in systematic theology, we looked at God's attributes, which Christian theologians sometimes refer to as God's perfections or His excellencies. And we learned that an attribute is a quality or characteristic. Some of God's attributes can be transferred to his creation. These are known as his communicable attributes. Others cannot be. These are known as his incommunicable attributes. And we listed some of his incommunicable attributes as his eternity, his infinity, God's omnipresence, omniscience, omnipotence. And we focused on God's aseity, God's having life in himself, being self-sufficient, and also his immutability, that God does not change. God's incommunicable attributes remind us that there is a difference between God and us. We can never possess an incommunicable attribute of Almighty God. Now, God's communicable attributes are attributes such as holiness and love and goodness, and these we can share in. And we learned last time that God's attributes are to be studied and delighted, they are to be enjoyed, they are to be imitated and praised and proclaimed. Uh, think of your own attributes and the things that people see in you. Some of our attributes we might try and hide. Uh, sometimes sinners, they glory in their shame. But through faith in Jesus Christ, God's communicable attributes are ours, and we are growing more and more in Him. Well, as we begin our, our next lecture, let's ask for Lord's blessing on our time. Please join with me in prayer. Lord, we praise you for who you are. We confess that you are infinite and eternal and unchangeable. And we thank you for the good news of the gospel, that while our first parents sinned and transgressed your commandment, we thank you that while they turned and changed and brought death into the world, we thank you for the sending of your Son. We thank you, Jesus, for taking upon yourself the obligation of the law for our righteousness, that you died for our sin, and that through faith in you we have been clothed in your righteousness. And we thank you that we are now, through your word and through your spirit, being renewed after your image and knowledge and righteousness and holiness of the truth. We ask now that you would bless us as we uh, continue in learning about your will and your providence. And it is our prayer that you would Show us your ways, O Lord, that you would teach us your paths, that you would lead us in your truth and teach us, for you are God, the God of our salvation, and in you we wait all day long. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In today's lecture, we'll be looking at chapters 14 and 15 of R.C. Sproul's Everyone's a Theologian. Chapter 14 deals with the will of God, and chapter 15 we'll be looking at God's providence. As we think about God's will, we need to keep in mind what we have been learning about God. So when you think of God's will, again with the emphasis on God, remember that God is triune, and remember what we learned in our last lecture about God's attribute. Because God is God, it means that God's will is eternal. There will always be a mystery and incomprehensibility to God's will that we as creatures cannot fully fathom. God's will is most holy. God's will is most wise. God is working all things according to the counsel of his immutable and righteous will for his own glory and for the good of those who love him. God, as we remember who he is and as we reflect today on his will, God is most just and terrible in his judgments for those who do not do his will. We also need to remember that there is only one who has ever lived and done the will of God, leading to salvation, and that is Jesus. And Jesus taught in John's Gospel that this is the will of God, that you believe in me. So Jesus has perfectly obeyed the Father. And so for those who trust in Jesus, God is most loving, gracious, merciful, and forgiving. God is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him in Christ. But for those who do not seek God in the Lord Jesus Christ, God will by no means clear the guilty. So the point we're making here is that when we are thinking of God's will, 
We can't forget who God is and how God has revealed himself. And it would be bad theology if we left out of God's will such things that God is most holy or most wise. Now, R.C. Sproul begins discussion of God's will with Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29, but I want to begin discussion of God's will with 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, because 1 Thessalonians deals both with the will of God and God's providence. Paul says in verse 16 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Here in 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul explicitly teaches that thanksgiving, giving thanks in all circumstances, is God's will. So this text brings together both the will of God and providence. God's will for us in Christ is that we give thanks. God's providence is here in all circumstances. Now, the Westminster Shorter Catechism summarizes the biblical teaching of God's providence when it asks, what are the decrees of God? And the answer is that the decrees of God are his eternal purpose according to the counsel of his will, whereby for his own glory he hath foreordained whatsoever comes to pass. Then the next question goes on to ask, how does God execute his decrees? And the answer is that God executes his decrees in the works of creation and providence. So here we're dealing with the decrees of God, his will, and his works of creation and providence. And then question 11, what are God's works of providence? And the answer is God's works of providence are his most holy, wise, and powerful preserving and governing all his creatures and all their actions. Now, did you notice God's attributes here in the Catechism's explanation of God's providence? We have here eternal That is his eternal purpose. That's one of the incommunicable attributes of God. There's the mention of God's glory, God being most holy, most wise, and powerful. In fact, the Westminster Confession of Faith mentions even more of the attributes of God in the definition of providence. In chapter 5 in paragraph 1, the Westminster Confession of Faith says of God's providence, God the great creator of all things, doth uphold, direct, dispose, and govern all creatures, actions, and things from the greatest even to the least. And notice here in bold now, the attributes of God by his most wise and holy providence, according to his infallible knowledge and the free and immutable counsel of his own will, to the praise of the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and mercy. God in his government and provision, and provision is another way of understanding God's providence, God in his government and provision or creation uses what scientists sometimes call the laws of nature or the scientific laws, laws like the law of gravity or the law of second, uh, the second law of thermodynamics. But these laws, whether or not scientists acknowledge it, these laws are descriptions of God's providence. Scientific laws are descriptions of how God upholds and directs and governs the world he created in the space of six days. Scientific laws, especially in the Western world, have become modern idols because they rob God of the glory due to him for his providence. So scientific laws, as often spoken of, they are impersonal. But God is personal, and God is personal in his works of creation and providence. So here's a six-minute video demonstrating the wisdom of how the the universe God created and upholds, how it is fine-tuned. And this is sometimes called the anthropic principle. This video briefly explores the parameters necessary to sustain life. And it's a helpful way of thinking about providence and the wisdom and power of God's government of creation. From galaxies and stars, down to atoms and subatomic particles, the very structure of our universe is determined by these numbers. These 
are the fundamental constants and quantities of the universe. Scientists have come to the shocking realization that each of these numbers has been carefully dialed to an astonishingly precise value, a value that falls within an exceedingly narrow, life-permitting range. If any one of these numbers were altered by even a hair's breadth, no physical, interactive life of any kind could exist anywhere. There'd be no stars, no life, no planets, no chemistry. Consider gravity, for example. The force of gravity is determined by the gravitational constant. If this constant varied by just one in 10 to the 60th parts, none of us would exist. To understand how exceedingly narrow this life-permitting range is, imagine a dial divided into 10 to the 60th increments. To get a handle on how many tiny points on the dial this is, compare it to the number of cells in your body, or the number of seconds that have ticked by since time began. If the gravitational constant had been out of tune by just one of these infinitesimally small increments, the universe would either have expanded and thinned out so rapidly that no stars could form and life couldn't exist, or it would have collapsed back on itself with the same result. No stars, no planets, and no life. Or consider the expansion rate of the universe. This is driven by the cosmological constant. A change in its value by a mere one part in 10 to the 120th parts would cause the universe to expand too rapidly or too slowly. In either case, the universe would again be life prohibiting. Or another example of fine tuning. If the mass and energy of the early universe were not evenly distributed to an incomprehensible precision of one part in 10 to the 10 to the 123rd, the universe would be hostile to life of any kind. The fact is, our universe permits physical, interactive life only because these, and many other numbers, have been independently and exquisitely balanced on a razor's edge. Wherever physicists look, they see examples of fine-tuning. The remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers seem to have been very finely adjusted to make possible the development of life. If anyone claims not to be surprised by the special features that the universe has, he's hiding his head in the sand. These special features are surprising and unlikely. What is the best explanation for this astounding phenomenon? There are three live options. The fine-tuning of the universe is due to either physical necessity, chance, or design. Which of these options is the most plausible? According to this alternative, the universe must be life-permitting. The precise values of these constants and quantities could not be otherwise. But is this plausible? Is a life-prohibiting universe impossible? Far from it. It's not only possible, it's far more likely than a life-permitting universe. The constants and quantities are not determined by the laws of nature. There's no reason or evidence suggests that fine-tuning is necessary. How about chance? Did we just get really, 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 really lucky? No. The probabilities involved are so ridiculously remote as to put the fine-tuning well beyond the reach of chance. So, in an effort to keep this option alive, some have gone beyond empirical science and opted for a more speculative approach, known as the multiverse. They imagine a universe generator that cranks out such a vast number of universes that, odds are, life-permitting universes will eventually pop out. However, there's no scientific evidence for the existence of this multiverse. It cannot be detected, observed, measured, or proved. And the universe generator itself would require an enormous amount of fine-tuning. Furthermore, small patches of order are far more probable than big ones. So the most probable observable universe would be a small one inhabited by a single, simple observer. But what we actually observe is the very thing that we should least expect, a vast, spectacularly complex, highly ordered universe inhabited by billions of other observers. So even if the multiverse existed, which is a moot point, it wouldn't do anything to explain the fine-tuning. Given the implausibility 
of physical necessity or chance. The best explanation for why the universe is fine-tuned for life may very well be it was designed that way. A common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect monkeyed with physics and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. There is for me powerful evidence that there is something going on behind it all. It seems as though somebody has fine-tuned nature's numbers to make the universe. The impression of design is overwhelming. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. Isn't God and His governing of the parameters for life most wonderful? Psalm 19 teaches that the heavens declare God's glory, and this would include the glory of God's providence. It's seen every day from the rising of the sun to its setting. Paul says in Romans chapter 1 that unbelievers in their unrighteousness suppress the truth of God's existence, creation, and providence. He says in Romans 1 verse 19, for what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. R.C. Sproul writes, Our culture, speaking of Western culture, has been heavily influenced by the pagan view that nature operates according to fixed independent laws as if the universe were an impersonal machine that somehow came together through chance. There is the law of gravity, the laws of thermodynamics, and other powers that keep everything operating. There is an infrastructure to the universe that makes it continue. However, the biblical view is that there could not be a universe in the first place apart from the divine act of creation. And when God created the universe, he did not step out of the picture and let it operate on its own. What we call the laws of nature merely reflect the normal way in which God sustains or governs the natural world. Perhaps the most wicked concept that has captured the minds of modern people is the belief that the universe operates by chance. Now, don't ever fall for the lie that scientific laws, laws are impersonal. God is at work all the time in his providential upholding and sustaining all his creatures and all their actions. It's one of the reasons God is to be feared, loved, praised, called upon, trusted, and served with all our heart, soul, and might. Now let's continue looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, where we find both God's will and his providence. Paul says that we are to give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Our circumstances are an outworking of God's providence. Nothing happens by accident or pure chance. Whatever your circumstance, God's providence, in other words, in your life, whatever your circumstances might be, whether they are sad or joyous, or whether there are circumstances in your family, your church, or your work, whether you are sick or healthy, whether you are young or old, Paul says that we are to give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So our circumstances include everything that happens in our life. It is according to God's wisdom, God being most wise. Our circumstances are according to his infallible foreknowledge and his free and immutable counsel to the praise of the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and mercy. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Now, if you are like me, you may be trying to think of exceptions. 
You may be thinking about times and experiences or events for which you are not thankful. And yes, there are things for which we should not be thankful. The Christian counselor Ed Welsh once wrote an article, I am not giving thanks. And he begins the article by saying, I took a bang to the head a little while ago and have had headaches ever since. I am not thankful for the headaches. I don't think they're good. And I certainly don't want anyone to tell me that they are for my best. Now, Ed Welsh, who is a Christian counselor, he goes on to say, We do not give thanks for oppression or victimization, and we do not give thanks for cancer, spinal cord injuries, or even more innocuous things like headaches. They are all attached to the fall of humanity and to sin. They are attached to death itself. They are not reasons for thanks. 1 Thessalonians 5, then, is telling us to give thanks in the midst of all circumstances. We can do this because Jesus has come and the Spirit has been poured out on us. Death itself has been defeated. We can give thanks in all circumstances because Jesus has overcome the world and misery does not have the last word. Amen. Misery does not have the last word. Now, there are consequences related to the fall and to mankind's disobedience to God's will. And for these things, we do not give thanks for our disobedience. In fact, we might say that at the root of Adam and Eve's sin was a failure to give thanks. It was a failure to honor God and his most holy and wise will. What Paul says in Romans 1 applies to Adam and Eve and all mankind for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Had our first parents given heartfelt thanks to the most wise God, I don't think they would have disobeyed God's will by eating the forbidden fruit in Genesis 3. So imagine giving thanks in that context of temptation. Imagine giving thanks before eating of the forbidden fruit and giving thanks by saying something to the following effect. God, I thank you that you are the living God. God, I thank you that you are the source of all life. God, I confess and acknowledge that you are abundant in goodness right? <laughs> there's, there's no way that you could go ahead and eat the forbidden fruit because the forbidden fruit was not good for eating. The forbidden fruit would introduce death. That was God's good word, right? The day in which you eat of it, you will surely die. So, there's no way you can be giving a, a heartfelt thanks. This goes back to what Paul says, doesn't it? That they did not honor him as God, or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Or imagine another scenario in which in Genesis 3, before the eating of the forbidden fruit, uh, our first parents took time to pray and give thanks. God, I thank you that you created the heavens and the earth. I thank you that you did this by your word. We confess and acknowledge the goodness of your word and all of your commandments. Now, as they thought about God's goodness and his commandment, there was also the commandment, which was good, you shall not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So, in that giving thanks, they would not have been able to partake with thanksgiving the forbidden fruit. Or again, imagine, and and again, this is helpful for us in, in thinking about our own sanctification and how we are to imitate God in holiness. We are to imitate God by by being wise in what he has said. We are not to be wise in our own eyes. That was what led to the fall of our first parents. They thought that they knew better, that there was something better for them outside the revealed word of God. So again, think of the prayer, most wise God. Right there, they would not have been able to eat of the forbidden fruit because by doing that, they were acting as if they knew better. So, if you stop and think about it, one of the most practical ways of growing in Christ-likeness is giving heartfelt thanks. 
Now, the circumstances the Thessalonians were exhorted to give thanks in was their believing the gospel. So, they had believed the gospel for their salvation, but subsequently, because of their faith in Jesus, they suffered affliction and tribulation. In fact, Paul begins 1 Thessalonians by saying in chapters 1 through 6, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always. So notice how much this sounds like 1 Thessalonians 5 and verses 16 through 18. Paul begins the letter, we give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So Paul rejoiced. He prayed constantly. He gave thanks in all circumstances. And the context of his thanksgiving was the gospel. It was the salvation of God's elect at Thessalonica. Paul was thankful that the word of truth was received with joy, the joy of the Holy Spirit, even in much affliction. Now, the affliction in itself is not something to be thankful for, but the results of that affliction are something for which Paul gave thanks. Look with me at verses 7 and 8 of chapter 1. Paul says in verse 7, so that you became an example. So here, God is working all things according to his will and his counsel, so that even in that affliction, the Thessalonians became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. So Paul was thankful that even in the circumstances of affliction for the gospel, the Thessalonians became an example to all believers everywhere. Affliction and tribulation for God's word and the gospel is part of the context of what Paul wrote then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. One of the key ideas for God's will is giving thanks in all circumstances. That's God's providence. And we give thanks because of God's love for us in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus calls to mind again who God is. God is most loving, most gracious and merciful in Christ Jesus. He is abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin. He is the rewarder of his faithful followers, those who take up their cross and follow Jesus. Remember that Jesus is the one who perfectly obeyed God's will for our salvation. Think of Psalm 40, in which the Son is speaking to the Father, where Jesus says prophetically, and even before the incarnation, I delight to do your will, O my God, your law is within my heart. In John chapter 4 and verse 34, Jesus said to his disciples, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. In John chapter 6 and verse 38, Jesus taught, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Think of the Garden of Gethsemane in Luke chapter 22 and verse 42, where Jesus prayed, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So we can give thanks in all circumstances, God's providence, because of who God is and because he so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son to save us 
from the result of our mankind's disobedience to God's perfect and holy will. So this prepositional phrase, in Christ Jesus, is most important for understanding God's will and our circumstances. Christ Jesus alone accomplished God's will for our salvation. That is why Paul exhorts us about God's will that we rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in all circumstances. Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is rooting God's will in the gospel. Think back to the night of Jesus' betrayal. Think back to the night that Jesus sweat blood in Gethsemane. Think back to the night in which Jesus' beloved disciples would flee from him. Think back to the night in which Jesus' close disciple, Peter, would deny him three times. Peter would say, I never knew the man, and he swore that on oath. Think back to the night before uh, when Jesus was arrested, and think back to the night when Jesus was then and would be after that falsely accused and wrongly judged for blasphemy. Think back to all of these things leading then to the crucifixion and the God-forsaken death. What did Jesus do in the night in which he was betrayed and all of these terrible things befell him? Jesus gave thanks. He gave a Thanksgiving meal. It's a meal that the church celebrates in the Lord's Supper. In fact, another word for the Lord's Supper is Eucharist. And Eucharist is a Greek word meaning thanks. It is a giving thanks. It is a Thanksgiving meal. In verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul reminds us the night in which Jesus was betrayed, what is he doing? Paul says that the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, so Jesus gave thanks again, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. At the very heart of the gospel is our Lord Jesus giving thanks in the night in which he was betrayed. And imagine the circumstances. If I were going to be betrayed and arrested and put to death tomorrow at the hands of wicked men, I would have a hard time giving thanks. But Jesus' death was not any ordinary death, was it? It was an accursed, God-forsaken death. And yet, in the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he gave thanks. Now, you might wonder, well, what did Jesus have to give thanks for? He did not give thanks for my sin that led to his betrayal and God forsakenness, but rather he gave thanks for the joy that was set before him. He gave thanks for me and for all whom the Father gave to him. He gave thanks for what his death would accomplish in God's most perfect, most righteous, most holy will for our salvation. Jesus fulfilled God's will and gave thanks. Therefore, we are to give thanks in all circumstances because God so loved us in the Lord Jesus Christ. So through Jesus fulfilling the will of the Father, the consequences of the fall, sin have been dealt with. Sin has been dealt with decisively once and for all. Death has been dealt with. The head of the devil has been crushed. We also give thanks because we have a future hope of glory. Jesus will one day return and there will be a new heavens and a new earth. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. Now, R.C. Sproul builds on God's providence in the, his chapter on providence, and he talks a lot about Romans chapter 8. And I'd like to look at Romans chapter 8, where Paul says in verse 28 of the providence of God, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, 
in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is it to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who is raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long, we are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, neither angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, R.C. Sproul wrote about Romans chapter 8 and being God for us that one of the oldest sayings of the ancient church summarizes the essence of the relationship between God and his people. Deus pro nobis. It means God for us. That is what the doctrine of providence is all about. It is God's being for his people. What then shall we say to these things, Paul asks? If God is for us, who can be against us? And who can separate us from the love of Christ? Is it going to be distress, peril, the sword, persecution, suffering, sickness, or human hostility? Paul is saying that no matter what we have to endure in this world as Christians, nothing has the power to sever the relationship we have to a loving and sovereign providence. God's providence is loving and sovereign. And one of the strange practices, though, as we think about God's loving and sovereign practices, one of the strange practices of some Christians today, and historically, is to treat God's will randomly. Christian History Magazine talks about how Christians would seek God's will for their life. That many early Christians, to discover the answer to a problem, would randomly open the Bible, read the first line their eye fell upon, and consider it a divine message for them. So popular was this practice, it had to be repeatedly condemned by early church councils. So here's what would happen. Christian believers are looking for the will of God and what direction does he want me to go in my life? And they would say, okay, God, lead me providentially to a chapter of the Bible and verse and you know, God, I'm looking for meaning and purpose in my life. And they, they open the Bible and, oh, there's Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes. And what does it say? Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. <laughs> that would be a terrible way, wouldn't it? Of, of simply opening our Bible up like that. Now, we should open our Bible and study it. But randomly to open the Bible and say, God, what is your will? And the, the first thing that my eye lands upon that is your leading, your guiding, your providence? No, that, that is very unscriptural. It's a, it's a strange thing because you're using the Bible, but you're using the Bible in an unbiblical way. You're seeking God's leading and his providence, but you're seeking it in a way that is contrary to the word of God. God is not a random God. He is not random in his loving of us. And that means that there should be no randomness. If you want to know the will of God, there should be no randomness in our love for God with all of our heart, soul, and strength. Remember Deuteronomy chapter 6, the great commandment. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and talk of them when you sit down in your house 
And when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. You see, the Christian life is to be purposeful. And the life of Jesus and his obedience in fulfilling the word of God was certainly purposeful. And so, therefore, the most important place for us to go for God's will for our lives is his word, but not a random study of the word of God where we open the Bible to any passage. Rather, we must give ourselves carefully to the study of God. And this is another reason, isn't it, why sound doctrine is important. Now, at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, Moses says to the people of God before they enter into the promised land, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Now, when it comes to the will of God and his providence, there are many things we do not understand. And it comes from the fact that God is incomprehensible. You know, oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. And so as we remember the incomprehensibility of God, there are aspects of God's will that we do not understand. There are certain aspects of God's will that are, are hidden from us. And theologians sometimes talk about God's will by talking about his decretive will and his preceptive will, and also his will of perception. Here's a chart looking at God's will, his decretive, preceptive, and his will, not of perception, but his will of disposition. Now, God's decretive will, this is God's sovereign will. The decretive will of God would be what Deuteronomy 29, 29 calls the secret things that belong to to the Lord our God. The decretive will of God has its roots in God's eternal and immutable will, and it cannot be resisted. God's decretive will is found in passages like Psalm 33, verse 11, Acts chapter 17, verse 26, Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30, Romans chapter 9, verses 14 through 18, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 through 18, and Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11, the Apostle Paul speaks about God's will, which theologians refer to as his decretive will, that having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So again, there's the decretive will of God, and, and Lord willing, we'll be looking more at the uh, the will of God and his uh, preceptive and decretive will, specifically his decretive will, uh, when we come to chapter 39, and we'll be looking at the theological topics of election and reprobation. Now, Christian theologians also speak about God's preceptive will. The preceptive will of God is part of the things revealed in Deuteronomy chapter 29. Remember that the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. God's preceptive will is found in the Ten Commandments. God's will that we give thanks in all circumstances is his preceptive will. God's preceptive will can be obeyed or disobeyed. God's preceptive will can be taught and learned. It's found in passages like Romans chapter 2 and Romans chapter 12. In First Thessalonians chapter five, God's preceptive or His preceptive will is give thanks in all circumstances. So we are to be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ for you. Now, Christian theologians will also sometimes discuss God's will of disposition, and God's will of disposition describes God's attitude, what is pleasing or displeasing to him. Like God's preceptive will, God's will of disposition is part of the things revealed in Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29. The things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. 
So God's will of disposition can be obeyed or disobeyed, and it's found in passages like 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4. God desires, that's his disposition, God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Or 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some understand slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So whether or not a person is saved is part of God's decreed of will, the secret things, but God's desire, and this is how we preach the gospel, his desire is that all should be saved or that all should repent. This is part of God's will of disposition. One of the purposes for studying God's will and learning God's will is for prayer. Question 98 of the Shorter Catechism asks, what is prayer? And the answer given is that prayer is an offering up of our desires unto God for things agreeable to his will in the name of Christ with confession of our sins and thankful acknowledgement of his mercies. And question 99 of the Shorter Catechism asks, what rule has God given for our direction in prayer? And the answer is, the whole word of God is of use to direct us in prayer, but the special rule of direction is that form of prayer which Christ taught his disciples, commonly called the Lord's Prayer. So things agreeable to God's will. So remember who God is and his attributes, most wise and most holy, and things agreeable to God's will. So God's will is the whole counsel of God, which we find in the scriptures. God's will we learn in the Lord's prayer. Uh, that we would walk. It says we, we think about the, the will of God. Part of that the prayer is that we would walk in God's will and in his precepts. Uh, we pray for God's will, that he would lead us not into temptation. Uh, when we pray, we confess our sin and confession of sin as a confession that we have not done the will of God. So not doing God's will is so serious that God had to send his son. When we don't walk in God's will, we must ask for forgiveness and praise God that he is most loving and forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. That if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us from unrighteousness, that cleansing that comes through the blood of Jesus. So God's will we're praying, right? Thy will, not my will be done, but thy will be done. The point here is that prayer is one of the ways we come to know God's will. God can open or close doors, but prayer is one of the ways in which we know for the circumstances of our lives. Another purpose of studying God's will is so that we don't fall into the trap of thinking that it doesn't matter how we live, or it doesn't matter whether or not we pray. Some people wrongly conclude from God's sovereign preceptive will that it doesn't matter. It's an incomprehensible mystery, we have to say, but prayer does matter. In fact, R.C. Sproul wrote that prayer is a means God uses to bring his sovereign will to pass. Prayer is part of God's decretive will. James puts it this way in chapter 4 and verses 1 through 3. What causes quarrels and causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain. So you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. In other words, on your own will and not God's most holy will. So, so you might think, well, you have not because God has not willed it, right? So you might think that that's why God doesn't answer prayer. I have not because God did not will it. But that's not actually what Scripture says, is it? Scripture says you have not because you do not ask. 
There are some things God would give or do in our lives, but doesn't because we do not pray. So we need to learn to diligently study scripture so we know what and how to pray. You have not because you do not ask. R.C. Sproul wrote a booklet called Does Prayer Change Things? And he says in this booklet, but what about intercession and supplication? It's nice to talk about the religious, spiritual, and psychological benefits and whatever else might derive from prayer, but what about the real question? Does prayer make any difference? Does it really change anything? Someone once asked me that question, only in a slightly different manner. Does prayer change God's mind? My answer brought storms of protest. I said simply, no. Now, if the person had asked me, does prayer change things? I would have answered, of course. The mind of God does not change, for God does not change. Things change. Our circumstances change, and they change according to his sovereign will, which he exercises through secondary means and secondary activities. The prayer of his people is one of the means God uses to bring things to pass in this world. So Sproul goes on to write, If you ask me whether prayer changes things, I answer with an unhesitating Yes, it is impossible to know how much of human history reflects God's immediate intervention and how much reveals God working through human agents. So we have learned that good theology leads to doxology. Now we can add that good theology also leads to prayer. It is God's will that we pray. And one of the things that stands out about Jesus' ministry is his prayer life. And this, of course, is not surprising because Jesus came to do the will of God the Father, and prayer is an essential part of God's will. It is God's will that the church prays. One of the ways I pray that this lecture would change you is that prayer and prayer meetings would be a top priority of your life. Make every effort to attend your church's prayer meetings, and if you have children, bring them also. It has been said that children who do not attend prayer meetings become adults who do not attend prayer meetings. Children learn from our priorities. And if you are a church leader, give God's people opportunities for prayer. Pray that your congregation would have a reputation for being a house of prayer. In summary, we have looked at the will of God in providence. Some of our main texts were 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verses 16 through 18, Romans chapter 8 and verses 28 through 39. We've looked at Deuteronomy chapter 6 and the secret things of Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29. We learned from the shorter catechism about God's works of providence which are his most holy, wise, and powerful, preserving and governing all his creatures and all their actions. That would be a good question to to memorize as you think about the definition of providence. We've also learned in this lecture about God's natural laws or the scientific laws and how they are descriptions of God's providence. We've also looked at God's will, as theologians will sometimes talk about God's decretive will, his sovereign will, his preceptive will. Uh, That is part of the, the things that God has revealed. God's preceptive will would be his moral law, the Ten Commandments. His preceptive will would be uh, his will that we be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. Uh, God's preceptive will uh, can be obeyed or disobeyed. We've also learned about God's will of disposition, which describes God's attitude, what is pleasing or displeasing to him. And lastly, we applied in this lecture God's will and providence to the importance of prayer. It's God's will that we pray, 
but some Christians fall into the trap that prayer doesn't really matter, that God's will is going to be done whether or not we pray. And it's true that God's immutable will does not change, but things change. Prayer changes things according to God's sovereign, immutable will. It's a mystery we cannot fully comprehend, but there are many reasons and benefits to pray, and these benefits are both seen and unseen. So let's go before our Heavenly Father and pray. Please join with me. Our gracious and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus, and that you, Jesus, uh, have done the will of God. We thank you that in the sending of your Son, uh, that we sing in Psalm 40, uh, your words, Jesus, that to, uh, to do your will, I delight, O God, your law is deep within my heart. We thank you that the, the will of God and, and your del- that delight to do God's will is a, a, a will and a love for the Father, a will and a love, uh, a love for your people, and that it led you to uh, the cross. Oh, Lord Jesus, we thank you so very much for this love. We uh, pray that you would forgive us of our sins. And just as you taught us to pray in, in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We pray that your church, Jesus, your bride, would have a reputation for being a house of prayer. We pray that one of the applications of this lesson, uh, that we would grow in our prayer lives as individuals and as families, and uh, that your church would be known and have that reputation for being a house of prayer. And we ask now that you, O Lord, would continue to shepherd us. Thank you for uh, the many encouragements that we have of your love as a, a good shepherd and the promise that we Uh, will not want. Uh, We thank you for and pray that you would lead us in the paths of your righteousness for your name's sake. We pray for those providential circumstances that even bring us sometimes to the valley of the the shadow of death. But we pray that in that, uh, that we would fear no evil, knowing that you are with us. And we thank you for that promise that the goodness and mercy uh, these beautiful attributes uh, will follow us all the days of our life and that we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And we thank you for being a God who hears and answers prayer. Uh, And we pray that thy kingdom will come and that thy will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm thankful that you were able to uh, join for this lecture on God's will and providence, and Lord willing, our next lecture will be on the doctrine of creation. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you.